Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics. I'm joined by a few of my trusty uh, friends, co-hosts, colleagues. Uh, I see Chris out there, Chris Dorides. Hi, Chris. Hey, Mark. I see Marissa, Marissa Di Natale. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Mark. And Dr. D'Antonio, Dante mm -hmm. D'Antonio. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Mark. We're, are we all in, in Southern California, in one part of Southern California or another? We're all down here, right? You guys haven't yeah. made it back. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Well, we were here for our conference, our, our LA conference, which I don't know. I'd say thumbs up, right? I Double thumbs up. Yeah. Double yeah, thumbs great. up. Yeah. How did Dante do in that debate with him, uh, Chris? Because yeah, you had the productivity debate. You're the bull, he's the bear. You know, he drew the short straw, so it was, it was tough. I keep losing. <laughs> I keep losing because your your forecast's too optimistic. So I, I lose by design, you know. Well, the numbers are getting pretty tough to deny the productivity growth numbers. Speaking of which, uh, the jobs numbers. This is a Friday, early Friday morning, at least early here on, on the West Coast. Not not early for you, Marissa. This is like. This is the know. norm. This How do you guys like this? <laughs> That's not, not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, <yeah>. Right, Chris. <laughs> not bad once a year, you know. Oh, once, once a year, a year. it's fine. Once a year, once a year it's fine. <laughs> year. All right. Well, we got the job numbers. Uh, and uh, Dante, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, you want to give us a rundown? Sure. I would say things were uh, pretty good. I think, you know, top line job growth number, maybe not quite as strong as, as some people were hoping for. 142,000 jobs added in August. Uh, I think on the on the more plus side of things, the unemployment rate did tick back down a little bit, which I think hopefully should uh, alleviate some concerns amongst people that we were going to just see the unemployment rate continue to, to creep higher. Um, in terms of industry employment, not a whole lot of surprises, maybe manufacturing, the biggest surprise was down uh, 24,000 in in August, it's it's surprising in that that's a, a big loss relative to what it's been doing, although it's not all that surprising given the sort of all the other weak data around manufacturing that we've had over the last two years. Um, other declines, retail had a small decline, uh, you know, temp help services continues to decline, but no real big surprise there. Uh, healthcare grew, but was a bit weaker than it's been in recent months. So I'm curious if that's the start of a new trend or just a, a one month sort of anomaly. Leisure and hospitality uh, added 46,000 jobs, strongest growing industry in August, um, which was good to see. The public sector still had a nice job gain at 24,000. So I would say you know, job growth was still fairly well uh, distributed. Um, I don't know. It yeah, made okay. me feel okay. You know, I don't, I don't yeah. feel great about it, but I don't feel bad about it. It's kind of down the middle for me. Okay. Um, two statistics, one positive, one more, more negative. You get, get your take. The first is the negative statistic and that's the revisions. There were downward revisions to the estimated payroll employment gains in the previous two months that they, they were consequential, right? They, I think in total, I mean, I looked at it quickly. I think in total, close to what sixty thousand in total, yeah. yeah, something like that. And it looks like on a three over the past three months through August, um, we're now seeing average monthly job growth of closer to hundred k, right? Uh, something like that. Uh, not not too far off. One hundred fifteen, yeah. One hundred fifteen. Yeah. So, okay, what do you make of that? The revision should we be worried? Not worried. I'm not particularly worried. I think, you know, if you look back six months ago, we sort of expected that job growth would be at or even below 100,000 by now. And that sort of got delayed a little bit by stronger labor force growth. So, I mean, the fact that we're seemingly headed towards job growth of 100,000 doesn't doesn't seem to worry me all that much, knowing that we've got rate cuts coming here quickly. And you know, I think things should hopefully stabilize where they are. But curious if anyone else is feeling more pessimistic about it. I'll, I'll go around the horn. I'm still working on you, Dante. All right, that's fine. I, I, I need to flesh out your views on this thing. You, you know, right. this uh, is pretty good. Uh, yeah, it's a little wishy-washy in my mind, the whole pretty good thing. Okay. Uh, but I, oh, I thought you were going to mention, and maybe this is, I got this wrong, but I, I thought August always, the payroll numbers in August always tend to come in, at least first print, which is what we got today, on the soft side, right? Be, be, the, the, kind of in my... Uh, thinking about this, that the re response rates, they're, they're, they tend to be lower, at least initially, because maybe people are on vacation in a way. And as the response rates, as people respond later, we get uh, upward revision. So uh, you, 
if history is a guide, you know, next month or the month after, and we get a take a look at the data, we might see an upward revision to August. Is that is that do I have that right? Yeah, I've, I've got some some stats for you if you want. You know, since since 2019 of the 24 years, uh, the August number has been revised higher, which mm -hmm. is obviously an unusual. Normally, low response rate should generate uh, you know more sort of even pattern of revisions up and down. But for some reason, in August, we tend to always get these upward revisions. The average upward revision between the first print and the third print is just over 60,000 in that period. So it's not an insignificant uh, revision. I will say the last two years have actually been small downward revisions in August. So maybe there's some chance that that pattern is, is shifting a little bit. But you know, if you look over a longer time period, it definitely would expect to see a, an upward revision over the next couple of months. Okay. All right. So uh, adding to pretty, the pretty good narrative. Yeah. Um, uh, on the upside, the statistic you didn't mention, or I might have missed it, was hours worked per week, which has been uh, weak. <laughs> uh, it has been, uh, I think, uh, I don't know where we are today, but uh, last month, I think we were uh, at a level that was below pre-pandemic uh, and hours worked had been had been steadily coming down. Uh, and just you know, to make this clear, you know, hours tend to be kind of a leading indicator of jobs. So businesses will cut back hours or add to hours of their existing workforce before they actually add or, or uh, cut uh, labor force. And the fact that that ticked up, that was a positive, a big positive, small positive, something we should. I, I think small positive. I mean, I guess I didn't, I didn't read too much. It did tick down last month and sort of reverse that decline this month. I mean, I right. you know, didn't oh, okay. read too much. It's been relatively low <laughs> here in recent months. And I think the, you know, you know, one tenth movement in either direction shouldn't get us too concerned at any given point. I mean, it's good to see that it came back up. I think that's a positive sign, but I wasn't too concerned. Anyway. Okay. All right. So pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. Marissa, what do you think? Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. I mean, it yep. seems like there was perhaps some bounce back from the hurricane effect we saw in the report for July. Um, that could partially explain the big increase in construction employment perhaps over the month. And we did see that the number of people that were on temporary layoff fell on the household survey side, which explained some of the downward movement in the unemployment rate. Um, I mean, you definitely see some weakness in here. Like for example, the number of people working part-time for economic reasons was up and it's up pretty significantly over the year. And mostly because people said, um, their employers are cutting back hours because of slack in in the business. Um, so it's it's okay. Like I think I think underlying job growth is somewhere probably between the July and August read. So I would say it's a bit over a hundred thousand a month, maybe one hundred and twenty thousand a month if you account for the weakness in July due to the hurricane and then some bounce back in August. Um, and then, yeah, I think on the industry side, if we look at the establishment survey, you definitely see, like we saw another straight month of very weak um, numbers for professional business services, which is a very large, right, white collar industry. And that was not only in temp help, but kind of across the board in professional business services. So most of the gain has come from leisure hospitality and healthcare last month and everything else was very weak. But it's not particularly worrying to me. I mean, the diffusion index, if you remember, we talked about that yeah. last month because mm -hmm. it had fallen below 50. It's back up above 50 if you look at the private industry diffusion index. So Can you explain that. What's what's so that's the share of all of these industries on the payroll survey side, the share of industries that are either adding to payrolls or keeping them steady. And typically when that falls below 50 that's been a pretty reliable indicator of recession if it if it stays there for consecutive months it had fallen below 50 in july but it popped back up in august yeah so 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 pretty good L let me ask you this yeah. though you said underlying job growth uh <clears throat> is between 100 and 150k per month so when you say underlying you mean abstracting from the vagaries of the data or events like uh, the hurricane that blew through yeah. and disrupted things for for a bit yeah uh and historically if you said 150k you'd say pretty good that would mm -hmm. you, you would describe it and that's the way you're describing it 
But is that appropriate in the context of the, all the labor force growth we, we we think we're getting? I mean, it's not showing. I know the labor force growth is kind of 150k in the in the household survey, the survey of households. But we know that that, or we think we know that that's understating the case because of all of the immigration that's happening, and those immigrants are applying for work and they're getting work and adding to the labor force. So if that were the case, it, it would suggest that 100, 150K may, may not be pretty good. It's not good enough. You know, you need something more than that to ensure that unemployment doesn't keep on moving uh, higher here. So how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that as we move through this, I, I think you're you're right. But I think as we move through the year now that the border is shut down basically since June, that immigration effect on the labor force will fade. So um, I think it's still happening, um, but I think it's less so than it was, say, a year ago when we had um, hundreds of thousands of people coming across the border every month. So now that that is not the case, that entrance into the labor force should be trickling off here month after month. Okay, so you're saying, okay, underlying job growth, payroll job growth uh, is 100, 150K per month. That may be a little on the soft side compared to where you'd like to see it at the moment, given the strong immigration. But we do know that the number of immigrants coming across the border has slowed sharply since uh, President Biden's executive mm -hmm. order. And that's going to start showing up in much slower labor force growth, more consistent with the 100, 150K. So yeah. we're good, pretty good, good to pretty good. Yep. Okay. Yep. I think okay, that summarizes it. Okay, good, good. Um, Chris, what do you think? I'd say the report was largely expected, but uh, that doesn't mean it makes me feel comfortable. I think there are signs of weakness there uh, that uh, Marissa highlighted. I also looked at the number of people with multiple jobs that ticked up pretty substantial, about half half a million or so. Um, so that all signs of uh, of weakening uh, in the job market. So again, we're at that point in the in the landing where it's you know seems to be going right, but uh, like a, a gust of wind and uh, and you're off course once again. So I'm not saying you should be nervous, but uh, you know it's it's not terribly comfortable either. Yeah. So. Uh... I, I don't look. I haven't looked at the multiple job holders. Uh, can you just give, give give us a sense of what that what's been happening there? Uh, what it, is it, that in in what's happening? You know, where, yeah. what's the trend lines here on that? Yeah. So it, it, it's an indication of people who hold more than one job. They may okay. have a full time job and a part time job or two part time jobs. So yeah, yeah, you know, an indication broadly speaking of people trying to piece together a full work week or you know certainly trying to supplement their income with additional. Uh, jobs because the their primary job is, is insufficient. So I I see that as a measure of uh, of weakness, right? If if your primary job isn't isn't doing enough, or you can't get enough hours, uh, you have to take the second second job. So seeing that tick up again, it's not falling off a cliff. It's not uh, uh, suggesting that everyone is is rushing out to get another job, but it's a it is a sign of of some weakness. And when you combine it with the other ones that Marissa mentioned like the, the broader measures of unemployment ticking up, you know, it's, it's an indication that things are not as robust as maybe they were a year or so ago. So is it, do you know, as a share of, of jobs, what is multiple job holders? Is it, is it, it's moving up, but is it high relative to historical standards? It's about 5.1%. Uh -huh. uh, I think that actually is kind of in line. I don't think that's in a, line. N nothing unusual. Not, it's just been not, moving up to your point. That, that's right. Trend line. That's right. Yeah, that's the... that, that. That's the issue. I mean, you, you're you're if you take the trend line and can extrapolate that forward, you go, oh, that could be a problem. The plane's not going to land because things are slowing. If they continue to slow, at some point you got a problem. And yeah, that's what you're saying. I'm you're worried that those trend lines don't start to to kind of level off here. Uh, that, that, that's exactly right uh, it's that you know inf point of inflection that uh, makes you nervous right yeah but but yeah. why would i mean what, what would be kind of the fundamental reason why those trend trends lines won't stabilize why will they keep slowing what what's the logic or intuition behind why they would continue to slow that there's some momentum uh here that or that there are some lags that we're not uh, fully capturing uh 
in the data, right? Or unable to see. I think that's the some of the noise that we're seeing. The revisions that we we mentioned, they're right. They're not inconsequential. So they are indicating, hey, things are not quite as rosy as uh, as the first print suggested. Right. So the the underlying fundamentals may be weaker. The consumer maybe is indicating some weakness going forward, and that would translate into you know softer job growth uh, in the future. But of course, if we are soft landing, this is exactly what you would see. This is exactly, I mean, this, is exactly that's the, this is exactly a soft landing, right? That I mean, that well, that's the paradox, right? At this yeah. point, it's exactly you know, the soft landing and the hard landing kind of look the same. Look the same. <laughs> uh, right. And now it's you know, what's is that gonna is the curve gonna hold or is it gonna yeah. continue to to um, you know trend downward uh, quick or even accelerate? Right. That's the that's the uncomfortable feelings. Right. But you say the odds are we're soft landing, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, we're, we're coming in and we'll see how this plays out. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. That gust, of, that gust of wind, who knows? You know, that we could get a gust of wind, which means couldn't predict that. That was com coming from someplace we, you know, had no idea. So that's right. That's right. And the instrumentation's a little, uh, you know, a little faulty foggy. there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, all, given all the revisions. Is, is right. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what about uh, average hourly earnings? Do you have any reaction uh, that came that came in strong month to month? I thought three was it three point eight percent. I heard year over year. Yeah, year over year. That's right. It was point four on the month though. So yeah, yeah, three point eight. Three point eight uh, is fine, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's exactly given. You're the productivity bull. So if yeah, we, yeah. If we've got all this productivity growth with two percent inflation. Three eight seems perfectly reasonable to me i mean you know yeah it's the point four. yeah uh, well but again it's a yeah. single month of, it's a single you know, month is it, is it affected by hours work and mix and so right oh no, uh, i don't i'm not worried about it at all um i i characterize it as pretty good the report uh i thought of you know uh i'm not sure what if i, I would have wanted to see uh, maybe other than the revisions i guess you know, if there were no revisions, downward revisions, I'd say picture perfect, kind of right where you'd want it. I mean, underlying job growth, 150, 150K, unemployment, 4.2%, uh, you know, uh, tick up an hour's work. The wage growth numbers were pretty good. The diffusion index, uh, I don't know, that that seems like, can't ask for much better than that. I mean, uh, and, you know, these job reports, you get you never get a perfect, a picture perfect job report. I mean, it's rare. You might get one every, you have, have a sighting once every three years or something where it's completely clear that this is a good jobs report, but it wasn't that, but it was, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Um, how about the market reaction? Chris, have you been following uh, what's the, how the stock market and uh, bond market are t uh, digesting all this? Yeah, stock market, I think was pretty, fairly tame. I don't know if they, any update in the last few minutes here uh yeah it's uh, kind of flattish and then uh the uh, fed futures that bounced around a little bit i think we had uh, last i checked uh, a little bit more weight on a 50 basis point cut for september now uh but i, I think it's like a 60 40 split so not uh again overly confident that uh the fed is going 50 and you always have to be uh, conscious of the initial reaction here. There's a lot of volatility um, once the number comes out. So I suspect that 25 is still in play. That I think that is the, the route the, the Fed will take, but certainly the market is uh, front running that. And I think uh, if you look further out by the end of the year, market is predicting 100, 125 basis points uh, in cuts. So whether that's how, whatever combination of 25 and 50 basis point cuts we get over the next three meetings. We're still planning on a you know, pretty significant reduction. So so the stock market kind of no big change here. Shook it off, yeah. Okay. And, and the futures market, the Fed futures are saying a little bit more weight on a, a half a point cut in the, in the funds rate when the Fed meets next week as opposed to a quarter point cut. Okay. Correct. Correct. And the 10-year treasury yield, anyone look at that? Is that uh, let's kind of, I kind of look at that as my bellwether. Yeah, it's flat. It's down a little bit, right? 
The yield is down a little bit. Uh, it's pretty flat, right? It's flat, pretty okay. flat. Yeah. Okay. I guess the the news there is that the uh, difference between the ten year and the two year is now positive. Oh, by, is by that two right? by two three basis points, but uh, oh wow, it is uninverting, which makes it again that dangerous time, perhaps. So. Dangerous because times pass when the curve it, it, the curve in, uh, in, it becomes inverted. Low, short rates rise above long. That's a long. That's a uh, a, a leading in, historically a leading indicator of recession. But what the next step is the curve actually becomes positively slope before you go into recession. That's what you mean. That's right. That's the. So here we are. It's actually now gone positive. <laughs> so history would say, boom, recession. Yeah. Well. And there's some exceptions there, but uh, yeah. Oh, are there uh, some exceptions? There's okay. a dangerous, well, the the other soft landing, right? I think uh, in, in the 90s, right? We had a- uh, Same deal. Same deal, but we used soft landings. We soft landed, yeah, okay. So, the, you know, the one thing I'm having a hard time getting my mind around when it comes to the in market expectations that investors uh, thinking about the Fed is these very dramatic rate cuts. I mean, 50 basis points, uh, that that's the majority of, of investors are saying 50 basis points for the September meeting. And then very aggressive rate cutting after that, getting the funds rate down very quickly. What do you suppose is going on there? Um, do you have a view, Marissa, on that? It seems like the bond market is more worried than we are about the pace of slowing uh, in the in the job market. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why that is, but that that's what I infer from these expectations of much bigger and faster cuts here. Like they're they assume the Fed is going to try to get back down to a neutral rate very quickly, right? Um, instead of taking their time. So I don't know, maybe they're more spooked by these jobs reports and the the upcoming revisions than we are. Yeah. That, that, oh, is that Dante, your interpretation as well? I mean is there I mean, any feels other like explanation for what's for why this is the case? <clears throat> why ostensibly they, the bond investors are more spooked about what's going on here? Nothing that immediately comes to mind. I mean, it just seems like you've got to be more worried or you're anticipating uh, that a recession is coming. I mean, that's historical. You know, we saw that earlier this cycle where there was a big expectation of the rates to decline, but it was likely just that you had an increasing share of investors who thought a recession was dead ahead. And so they were expecting obviously huge cuts. And then you had another group that was expecting no cuts because they weren't expecting recession. So it could be some of that divergence and you know, sort of what the view is of the economy moving forward and how the Fed will obviously react in a different way, if that's the case. Yeah. Chris, any theories? I think investors have bought into this idea that inflation is licked and, uh, you know, we're, that's no longer uh, an issue uh, um, and you know, time to get move on with, away from the restrictive policy. Right. Right. Could it be the case? Uh, I'm thinking out loud that you, you, that uh, there is, is the, the distribution of possible outcomes here, uh, here in the minds of bond investors isn't kind of this normal distribution. It's kind of they've got this fat tail where they're attaching investors are attaching a you know, unusually high probability that something can really go off the rails here. You know, some something's going to come in and knock us off and, you know, push us into recession. Some dark scenarios. And if you put attach a much higher weight on those tail kind of scenarios, you could get this result in the futures market. Does that, does that make sense? Is that a possibility? Chris? I think so. Yeah. You always have, you always have to be cautious when you look at those fed futures um, because it's, it's not just a bet, a one you know, a single uh, point bet in the distribution. To your point, it's it's reduced for risk management, right? So, uh, for that from that standpoint, it, there's a distribution of outcomes. And yeah, if the tail is a bit higher for recession risk, then that's going to push more weight on those lower rates. Yeah, I mean that I, it's hard for me to believe. I mean that feels more right to me than the explanation that bond investors are just more pessimistic than we are. I mean. I, I don't know. I don't know why they would be more pessimistic, but but I'm confused by a little bit confused by why they think it's going to happen so fast here. You know, because in my thinking is that two reasons why the Fed's going to go more slowly here. One is, and and by the way, don't get me wrong. I would have no problem if they cut more quickly. That would be 
okay in my book. I think they've been, you know, obviously keeping rates too high for too long and they should get moving here. And I, I'm all on board with, with them cutting rates quickly, but two reasons why they might go more slowly, you know, one is why should they, uh, you know, the economy is kind of doing what they wanted to do. Inflation kind of back in the bottle, no real pressure to go more quickly. I mean, that generally the fed won't cut rates 50 basis points or more than a quarter point, unless there's something really going off the rail somewhere and nothing's going yes. off the rails anywhere. Uh, and the second reason is the equilibrium rate is that that's the rate at which policy monetary policy is neither restraining or supporting growth feels it's always we don't ever know what it is. There's no nothing etched in a stone somewhere saying that's what the equilibrium rate is. It's an empirical question and the equilibrium rate will vary over time given circumstances. And it's probably a lot higher right now than it has been historically. But there seems to be a lot more uncertainty with regard to what that equilibrium rate is and if you're uncertain in this case i think you just go more slowly uh, you just kind of lower rates in a more systematic consistent way and uh, and not dramatically because you don't you, again you don't know where equilibrium is but does that resonate with you chris yeah i think it does um all right okay okay um, all right. What does this all mean for the presidential election? I mean, that's the other question on my mind. Uh, I don't know how, Dante, do you have a view on that? What do you think? Is this going to favor one candidate or the, over the other? I mean, it feels to me at this point, like if things, if this status quo holds, that favors Harris in my mind. You know, it seems like if things start to go off the rails, that that's more in Trump's wheelhouse to, you know, lay blame at the feet of the Biden administration and, you know, you know, stake a claim that we need change and we need something else to happen. Whereas if the economy sort of holds up and gets through this, it you know, sort of, I think, solidifies the Harris position a little bit more that things have been fine. We've dealt with inflation, you know, the policies that have been in place have, have worked and not sort of contributed to that. And so it feels to me like if this holds out for another two months, that that's a, a positive for Harris, but uh, Dante, you're thinking that your your sense is that generally this is a plus for Harris over Trump because it shows the labor market is hanging tough, that we're, we are soft landings. You can point to the un low unemployment rate, the job growth, and that should favor her. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marissa, you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd be more worried about <clears throat> what the next couple CPI reports look like. Like if, if the job market stays like this, I think it's fine. I think people are really focused on inflation and that's been most of the talk around the economy mm. with regard to the candidates. So I think as long as you don't see an uptick in inflation over the next few months, I think that favors her. Yeah. Okay. And Chris, what do you think? Yeah, same. I think the focus is on prices more than labor market, as long as it you know remains positive and even if it's slowing, I, I don't think that's a really a fodder for a, a really uh, aggressive political attack. Yeah, I think all the data favor Harris. Don't, if you look at our uh, presidential election model, this, we have a model that predicts the uh, who's going to be the next president based on a bunch of uh, political and economic factors. That all points increasingly points to Harris. There are three key economic variables in the model. One is uh, gas prices. Uh, and the cost of a gallon of regular unleaded. And according to our Pennsylvania Wawa, not, I was looking at California gas prices. Don't. They are. <laughs> wow. It's a whole other world out here. A whole other world. Yeah. Uh, but I, in our local Wawa back in PA, it's three buck 30 and that's moving South. I mean, we saw oil prices, they're, they're back down. I think I saw West Texas intermediate down below $70 a barrel, which is Pretty low and could probably consistent with three dollars a gallon for regular unleaded and three buck fifty is kind of a, a threshold. Anything above three fifty, people start to take notice of that and gets into the media and probably would favor uh, a former President Trump. Anything south of three fifty, closer to three, which it seems like we're where we're headed here, that would definitively favor uh, Harris. Uh, the other is uh, the th the thirty year fixed mortgage rate uh, goes to housing affordability and. Uh, right now, Chris, I think we're at 6.3, aren't we? Or something like that on the 30 year. 6.35. 6.35. Uh, and, you know, 
uh, the threshold there is something closer to 7% would favor Trump. Uh, anything south of 6, 6.5 headed towards 6, which is what it feels like we're doing here, uh, given the what's going on in the bond market uh, and Fed expectations, that favors uh, Harris. And then the third is real household income, real meaning after inflation. And given today's jobs numbers, if you you know add up the jobs, add up the hours, because hours were up, if you add up the wage growth, that you know that picked up a little bit. That means more income, uh, and you know, as you point out, if inflation remains tame, which it feels like it will, uh, particularly given the, the gasoline prices, then that would argue because diesel prices are also down and diesel goes into food and grocery prices. And that's really key to how people are thinking about inflation. So all that, if you do the calculation there in your mind, that comes up with real, real incomes that are growing pretty strongly, which favors Harris. Uh, so our model is now saying that she's going to win with, I think did, I, I missed uh, Brendan and Justin's uh, presentation yesterday at the conference about on this, but I think we're around 280, 280, five uh, electoral votes and she needs 270 to win uh and so the economic data seems to be a tailwind uh, behind behind her uh agreed everyone on board with that yeah, yeah okay uh okay um so uh, we're gonna this is gonna be a short podcast because we're all in la and we all got to get somewhere <laughs> so we got to catch planes <laughs> So we're not going to go on, but I'm going to let's end the conversation with, uh, you know, probabilities of recession. We haven't done this in a while. So what's the probability the economy is going to enter into a recession, let's say between now and the end of 2025? Uh, and uh, give me the odds and uh, uh, let me know if it's changed from the last time we, we had. The, I can't quite remember what everyone's odds were, but if you if it changed, let me know. So let me begin with you, Dante. What, what are the odds of recession? between now and the end of next year, starting between now and the end of next year? I, I'm still, I think this is unchanged. I think 25% is basically okay. where I'm at right now. I think, you know, they're still slightly elevated, but I don't feel any worse today than I did a month or two ago. Okay, 25. Uh, Marissa? Yeah, 25 for me. 25 for you? Yeah. Has that, has that changed? I don't remember what I said last time. You Was went I, up. I might have been higher. Yeah, I might have been a little more spooked by that benchmark revision um yeah 25 25 okay and chris i'm sticking with a third 33 <clears> percent <throat> really are you really that high yeah yeah okay. it's the Very most dangerous high. time in the economy right again back to the uh soft landing metaphor right? yeah i i think i'm gonna go i'm gonna go down 20 percent back down I, I think i was at 20 i went to 25 and now I, I, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm going to go back down to 20. That's that California weather. Is yeah, that what it so. is? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's feeling good. And a great conference. Pretty so, good. Yeah. yeah, it was a great conference. It was a great conference. Um, okay. Uh, anything else, guys, before we call it a podcast? I, I, this may be a record short podcast. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's, typically, it's probably more, it's double this length. But uh, I'll just say one more thing. I mean, I yeah. think some of the other labor market data that came out this week also makes me feel a little better, right? So jobless claims fell. Mm. Um, we got the jolts data, hiring ticked up a little bit. So it it kind of just shows this slower, but okay job market. Nothing, nothing is cratering here. So all of that together makes me feel better about it. Yeah. And I guess it's the unemployment insurance claims that we're most focused on in terms of yeah. the as to whether we're soft landing or not, whether the job market's holding together or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Anything else, Dante? Chris? Yeah. Nothing? Okay. Uh, I think we're going to uh, call this a podcast. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you next week. Take care now.